Anarcho-capitalism advocates for capitalism and free association as a replacement for government. Today, Brian Kaplan, popular anarcho-capitalist thinker and author, will come on to talk about his beliefs. Thanks for coming on. So what is anarcho-capitalism? Um, anarcho-capitalism is the view that all of the legitimate functions of government should be privatized, and in particular, the functions that we think of as most fundamental to government, namely police, courts, and the legal system, those in particular should be privatized. That's what is distinctive about the anarcho-capitalist view. What are your criticisms of left anarchist ideals in comparison to right anarchists? Actually, where do I start? I guess the main thing is just severe economic illiteracy. So just being unaware of basic ideas about it's important to give people incentives in order to be productive. And it is highly unlikely that worker organized firms are going to be very good at organizing themselves or giving incentives. Uh, so in competition between different kinds of production, worker run firms have never done very well compared to other sorts. Um, and then just you know, more basic ignoring of things like scarcity and that sort of thing. And then I guess also you know, like when you bring up alleged cases of left-wing anarchism in practice, I would say when you really look, usually there's nothing really anarchistic about it. So if you look at so-called anarchist collectives during the Spanish Civil War, they really are basically run like normal dictatorial socialist organizations. So it really comes down to this Orwellian fiction of this is anarchism because we're ruled by an anarch instead of by a government. We're ruled by an anarchist cooperative uh, who are in turn ruled by an inner party of anarchists. So. Um, yeah, I would say it's just a very poorly worked out view. So in that case, do you think firms like cooperatives and communes could not function in an anarcho-capitalist society just based on merit? Uh, what I'd say is that there would be some of them. So essentially, organizations like that, first of all, every now and then there's one that has some extra magic where it actually is able to work well. So every now and then there is a group of people that work really well as a team. And so for them, a cooperative could be fine or a commune could be fine. Um, and of course, people are also free just to accept a low standard of living in exchange for doing things in accordance with the philosophy they share. So I know in my home state of Virginia, there is a very socialist commune somewhere down further south in the state. And they basically just live on about $5,000 a year each. So they just accept a very low standard of living in exchange for following their philosophy. What I do say is that this kind of thing is unlikely to be widespread. It's going to be a small niche market because most people actually aren't interested in joining, joining a commune anyway. And especially if they have to take a big hit to their living standard to do so, then I think it's a small number of people that want to do it. Why would you say top-down economies are unlikely to succeed? Uh, right. So you know, the easiest thing is just to look at actual historical cases. So the most famous top-down economies are, of course, uh, the Soviet Union and communist China. And when they were run top down, they were notorious not only for low living standards, but especially during the transition, like actual mass starvation and other horrors like that. On terms of why it is that we've seen things work this way, uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of reasons. So one is just that the priorities of top down economies are usually for just preserving the power of leadership. So countries like that usually focus on having an enormously powerful military, uh, enormous secret police, or guarding the borders so the people don't get out alive. And then also things like space programs, athletics. So, you know, communist countries have been great in, in athletics, great in space. So, uh, but basically they go and they have the short list of priorities they pour a lot of resources in, but they just make actual consumer living standards a really low priority and that shows, so that's part of it. Again, another part is it really is just very complicated to plan out an entire economy. Again, probably like a deeper part of the story is that there's been quite a bit of work on the importance of what we could call selection versus, uh, you know, you know, you know, selection, let's we'll see, what, how should we call it? Uh, difference of, you know, you know, so the, you know the, the difference in business between how important it is for firms to improve versus just for better firms to survive. So we can think of this as, you know, the problems of actual conscious improvement versus uh, you know, you know, versus, versus attrition. So in a big result of this is that a very large share of economic progress doesn't come from firms learning to improve. It comes from incompetent firms going out of business and shrinking and more competent firms uh, expanding and uh, surviving or surviving and expanding. And once you realize this is a general pattern, then it makes sense that top-down economies are going to have very poor productivity growth 
because they're just set up to not allow this kind of attrition, just to say, look, the government runs it. And if it's not working, then we're going to put more money behind it as much as it takes in order to make it work. Instead of saying, maybe you're just not good at your job and you should let someone else do it. But if it's top down, there is no one else. You have excluded them by definition. Would you say modern governments like the United States suffer the same issues? Oh uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, to some extent, you know, so like, you know, it's all, it's all a matter of degree. But yeah, so you know, like you know, most obvious these days is the terrible rollout of the COVID vaccine. You know, like the free market way is just to say companies can go and sell it to whoever they want, and the company, and then the distributors can go and sell that to whoever they want. And in this way, you wind up harnessing the full power of the system to try to make money in order to get vaccines in arms. And instead, we have this grotesque centrally managed system, all in the name of greater equity. Uh, but in terms of just getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible, I think there's very little doubt it would have been better to do it the normal way. And so my understanding is actually, you know, like, you know, we're, we, we we're better normally just doing a flu vaccine rollout than doing this one, even though this one is so much more important. What is your ethical system based on? Uh, so I am a big fan of a book called The Problem of Political Authority by Michael Humer. And this is the closest to my view. So it uh, comes down to this. So First of all, my, 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 my ethical presumption is that I should not try to, or really no, you know, no one should try to you know, threaten violence or take someone's property in order to get what, get what they want from them, unless, unless what? Unless there are very clear, enormous gains to bending the rule, all right? So I'm not an absolutist who says that we should let the earth perish from an asteroid because uh, we don't wanna go and steal a dime from everyone in order to deflect the asteroid, that's a crazy view. But the idea that, if you've got a viable way of making something happen without going and forcing people to do it, they should just use that. That view makes a lot of sense to me. And again, I think this is actually a much more common view than um, we realize. So again, in the case of free speech, there are a lot of arguments about how it's really productive to allow free speech and we learn more and it leads to greater progress and so on. And there's something to this, but this doesn't really explain how committed people are to free speech. For example, what exactly do we gain from keeping Satanism around? And that's where I would just say, look, yeah, I don't see any big gains to Satanism existing, but unless there is some enormous social harm caused by the presence, we should just tolerate them and let them do their thing, even though, yeah, it probably isn't. You know, it's not a very fruitful set of ideas. It doesn't lead to the advance of truth. Uh, a lot of the families, the members involved probably really don't like it, but better to just say, look, you're just going to have to tolerate it. And it's just not so bad that it's justified to do anything other than try to persuade people to not do it. Uh, so that's basically where I'm coming from. This is how I approach you know, really all issues is, you know, so first of all, like, so, right, are we talking about actually putting a gun to people's heads and telling them they have to do something? And if the answer is yes, then is there really no other way? Is it really such a severe case that we couldn't just go and try to cope with dissent the normal way just by saying, well, um, you really have to do that and try to change their minds? Um, so that is where I'm coming from. What are your thoughts on minarchism rather than anarcho-capitalism as a way of achieving liberty? All right. Yeah, so minarchism is you know, very similar to anarcho-capitalism, except it keeps those last three industries that I was mentioning in the hands of government. It keeps the police in the hands of government, it keeps the courts, keeps the law, and obviously also keeps the military. Uh, so my views on that, uh, first of all, of course, the real world is so far from either that I would be incredibly grateful to get minarchism or anything close to that. Uh, but if I were having a conversation with minarchists about why it is that I think my view is better than theirs, a part of it is just to say, look, you know, all the arguments that you're making in favor of deregulation, privatization, I say they, act, they actually also apply to these last industries. The arguments that you're making about why these industries are different don't really hold water. So in particular, you know, so, you know, start with something like the police. All right, so someone says, look, the government has to have a monopoly on police. Like, well, does it really? Do you favor getting rid of security guards? Like, no, no, of course not. All right, well, there's already more security guards than police. Does that make you nervous about our society being unstable or maybe there'll be a war between police and security guards? No, no, that's ridiculous. All right, well, what if we just start moving the dial away from police and towards private security? When do you start getting nervous, All right? So if we've got, say, three private security guards for every two cops. How about if we get three to one? Are you nervous then? Are you nervous at five to one, 10 to one, right? And I say, really, it just comes down to as long as the change doesn't happen overnight, 
Um, you know, it is actually much easier than most minarchists would admit to dial down the level of government down to something that is way lower than what they consider minimal, right? And then the question is, what about that last click going from one to zero? Can we do that, right? And I say actually we can. And um, so that, and again, so while there is some risk to that, of course, there's also an obvious risk of a minimal government becoming more than minimal. So I would keep that in mind as well. Uh, but again, you know, my argument with them is the kind where you have to share a lot of premises before the argument even makes sense. So again, I wouldn't in any way blame someone who was listening who said this seems like a very narrow debate. And I say, yeah, well, it is. Uh, so if you just have a very different view about how the economy and society works, then the argument really won't, won't make much sense. Which is why, honestly, I really only talk about anarcho-capitalism to people who already are convinced that free markets are great and government is terrible. Because for anyone else, uh, I would just seem crazy. So, again, you know, my main goal here, by the way, when, whenever I'm sharing radical views, I don't, I, I do not expect, and I think it would be crazy to even even hope for people to suddenly change their minds in a drastic way. Uh, what I do hope is that people say, "Hmm, the guy doesn't sound crazy. The view seems crazy, but he doesn't." So I don't know. Maybe I'll look into it some more. How do you plan to spread the anarcho-capitalist movement? Right. So really it's the same as for any radical views. So people with radical views, often their imaginations turn to violent revolution. And you know, I say that's absolutely crazy. Uh, never mind that our numbers are so few, we wouldn't have any hope. But more importantly, violent revolutions almost always end very badly. Right? It's not a bad way to establish a totalitarian despotism. It's a really bad way to improve anything. So strongly against any kind of use of violence or um, of, of any kind uh, to bring this about. Uh, so once you've got that, what's left? Uh, so in the main one, overwhelming is persuasion. So just talking to people and saying, like, I've got these ideas, they make sense to me, and trying to sell them. Uh, there's, of course, a whole set of standard rules about how to make yourself more persuasive to others, which I personally try to follow. Say probably most anarcho-capitalists are really bad at this and deliberately alienate people for no reason. I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie's uh, classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Again, this doesn't mean that I think that I'm super persuasive, just a lot more persuasive than I would be if I were yelling at people and getting angry, which I'm just not. Uh, so again, like, like, you know, so like the you know, ways to be more effective in persuasion, you know, a big part of it is always to talk to people like they're a friend, right? And even if they don't treat you very well, try to treat them well and just try to win them over that way. Uh, so that's, that's a big start. Of course, just getting to know people on a personal level is very helpful, right? And you know, trying to find common ground and trying to admit as many things that you honestly can. Say, look, we have a bunch of agreements. Uh, so like, I'm, we're not really totally different. And then let's think about the areas where we are different. So if we can have a meeting of mind in some areas, perhaps some others would be possible as well. And then in terms of you know, other possibilities. Uh, so I, mean, I will say that very often the case for moves in an anarcho-capitalist direction really come from neither persuasion nor violence, of course, which is a terrible approach, just comes from demonstration. So when you see things like Uber working, right? This is the kind of thing that would have just seemed like a pipe dream a few years ago. It's like, we're gonna have this unregulated taxi system and there'll be no licenses and anything else. And people see it and they learn it they, from the firsthand experience and say, actually, not only is it not bad, it's actually great. So there's a lot of cases like that that are worth thinking about too. So once you've convinced a sufficient amount of people, how do you actually get rid of the state? Do you reform it or do you undermine it? Right. So of course there's both. Again, if you actually have a sufficient numbers, then I would just say, yeah, well, like you know, we've got democracy in place. Why not just vote to start shrinking the government down a lot, right? So you know, like you know, voting, like if people want what we have, then democracy will give us what we have. If they want something very different, then I think democracy is likely to give us something that is much closer to what I want. You know, there is sort of a conspiracy theory that no matter what you do, that democracy will keep doing more of the status quo. Again, you know, I say like if we actually had a clear majority that wanted much smaller government it would happen. Uh, so I do have a book on this called The Myth of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies. And what I say there is the status quo is actually quite popular. The parts that are unpopular really come down to people have impossibly high expectations or they just, what they want or is self-contradictory and that's why they don't get it. So like, why can't we have a politician who is both wise and successful? It's like, yeah, well, 
because if he were wise, then you'd be angry at him for doing wise things. And to be successful with voters as they are, you've got to say a lot of things that are very silly in order to pander to them. Uh, so I'd say a democracy would be a big, a big part forward. In terms of resistance, so again, like you know, violence, I think is almost always a bad idea, and it's just likely to uh, call, you know, to move things in a less free direction. Um, in terms of other activity, just civil disobedience, and I think there's a good place for that as well. Just if the law isn't fair, just start ignoring it. If enough people do that, then you can't enforce it anymore. People are generally worried. Well, what if people people start ignoring the good law? So, well, I didn't say they should do that. Uh, Again, the idea that as soon as you start ignoring some bad laws, you're going to start ignoring all laws, that just seems uh, dogmatic and crazy to me. Just because people drive 10, minute, 10 miles over the speed limit doesn't mean they start robbing and killing. So people just realize, gee, this law is too slow. Like people, it's reasonable for people to go faster and they just break the law and uh, seems fine to me for, to do so. What are your thoughts on Hans Hermann Hopp and specifically his views on borders? Yeah, so Hans Hermann Hopp, uh, um, Honestly, I'd say he's a very smart, but extremely dogmatic and ignorant man. So put all that together. Uh, that's my general picture. So I've read several of his books. I actually got to listen to some of his lectures when I was just out of high school. Um, you know, he's, you know, like, you know, he's very impressive to someone that doesn't know a lot because he is genuinely very smart. His IQ is very high. But there's just so much about the world that he has never studied, and he's got a whole philosophical system that justifies not studying so much. Again, he's got a whole set of epistemological rules that tell him that he just doesn't have to really look at most empirical work. Uh, his book that's closest to what I'm doing is called Democracy, the God that Failed. And in this one, you know, he actually does his, you know, numerous statements to the effect of people are voting for their own self-interest. And again, this is something that someone who knows the, like the very basics of empirical public opinion research would say that's just not really true. So uh, in terms of borders, yeah, so he does have this idea that, first of all, it is justifiable for governments to restrict immigration today. And then this is based upon some analogy to under anarcho-capitalism, the owners would be allowed to go and restrict access based to, to whoever they wanted. And what I would say to, uh, to these is, first of all, Yes, it's true that under anarcho-capitalism, owners would be free to restrict who access pro accesses the property, but it would be very unusual for people to go and turn away people based upon nationality because they can make money, right? So the reason why malls are, are not going and asking people for their identity cards to make sure they're citizens of the country or checking their passports, it's not because, not because uh, the law says that they aren't allowed to check those papers, it's because why do I want to go and turn away customers? So I would say that the idea that there would be any significant effort by private owners to go and keep, keep customers off their property is uh, quite fanciful. And then in terms of saying that it's okay for governments to do this, this is you know, really quite an odd thing for a self-styled libertarian to say, uh, because you know, the same argument of, well, the people of a country own their country, and so they're entitled to keep people out if they want to, would also justify every other act of government that Hoppy opposes. So you could say, look, you know, you're not allowed to open, you're not allowed, and therefore you can't immigrate to my country without permission. All right, there's that argument. Similarly, you're not allowed to open up a store in my backyard without my permission. Therefore, you shouldn't be allowed to open up a store in the country without the government's permission. These are exactly analogous arguments. And if you buy the, if you, and if you buy the first, you should buy the second. If you buy the second, then really you have to throw away virtually all libertarian opposition to government. So again, I would say that the idea that a government is in any way analogous to a private property owner is really quite crazy. And again, once you accept that, then you are on your way to totalitarianism. So I sometimes actually call this view anarcho-totalitarianism, where you start calling yourself an anarchist and wind up justifying the most oppressive acts of government you can find. And I think that is what he winds up doing. Uh, so that's my, my quick version on Hans anyway. How do you think open borders might affect the labor market? Uh, right. So I mean, just for background, so you know, open borders is a immigration policy where anyone is allowed to take a job anywhere. Uh, so there's no necessary connection to anarcho-capitalism, right? You could have right now, we could have open borders with no other changes in regulation, or you could have open borders with anarchism and so on. In terms of the effects on the labor market, uh, so 
course, the usual view is that you're increasing labor supply a lot, and this is going to be terrible for existing workers because you're giving a lot more competition. You increase supply of anything and the price price goes down. Uh, what I say is this is clearly true when you're talking about increasing labor supply in one particular occupation. So yeah, if you let in a bunch more economics professors from other countries, this is bad for me, right? And it does hurt my wages and job market prospects. But it does not follow that when you let in a lot of workers from a lot of occupations that it hurts everybody for the following reason. Um, you know, my, so the losses to me of having cheaper economics professors are also are gains to everyone who is a customer of this product. So you also so whenever you're thinking about these labor market effects, you need to be thinking about not just how there'll be more workers competing with me. There, you also have to think there'll be more workers that are offering me things in order to get my money, right? So both things are going on. Right? So when there's more workers in your area, there's both more people that compete with you, but there's also more people who sell the stuff that you want. And the first thing is bad for you, but the second thing is good for you. And then the hard question is, so what's the net effect? So if a lot more workers move to your area, which effect is actually larger? This is the effect of there are more people competing for my job or the fact there's more people competing for my dollars, right? And the best way to answer this question, I say, is to go to the most fundamental principle of economics, which I say is this. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. Societies are rich when they produce a lot per person. They are poor when they produce little per person. There's basically no exception to this rule. And then if you take a look at what the standard effect of immigration is, it is to move labor from countries where labor produces little to countries where labor produces much, which means that immigration doesn't just enrich immigrants, it enriches humanity, right? If you moved everyone from Haiti to the US, this wouldn't mean that the GDP of Haiti would fall by as much as the GDP of the US would rise. Rather, it would probably mean the GDP of the US would rise by say 10 to 20 times as much as the GDP of Haiti fell because the Haitian workers are so much more productive here. And that means that the correct answer to the question, what is the net effect of immigration overall is that it is going to increase total production and raise overall living standards. So the right answer is, is what is the effect of open borders on the labor market? is that on balance, it is going to greatly increase living standards. Although of course, there's all, it's always possible that some particular person happens to lose out. If a particular region dissolved its governments, what would prevent other nations from eliminating anarchism within the region through divide and conquer? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So, and it's actually very similar to, very similar to the early question that socialists had of, can we have socialism in one country or do we need to have a world revolution? Won't the other capitalist countries go and crush us in the cradle, right? And uh, the actual story in that case was during the very early years of the Soviet Union, there were some very, not even half-hearted, maybe one-tenth hearted efforts to go and aid the non-communist forces in the Soviet Union, and then the West gave up and they just allowed it, right? So that is just the first step. Now, if you say, why is it that they allowed it? So part of, part of it is countries are war-weary from World War I. Another big part is just that the, there are sympathizers in the home countries. And so Britain and France especially don't wanna to have to deal with protests from those that sympathize with the Soviet Union, right? So anyway, what I say is that if there were a particular country that were anarcho-capitalist, while it is possible that neighbors would go and try to attack them and overthrow it, I don't think this is actually that big of a risk. Again, part, you know, partly just because it's too much work, partly because there's going to be a lot of sympathizers. So if one country actually goes anarcho-capitalist, there's going to be vociferous minorities in other countries saying, let's give this noble experiment a chance, right? And then on top of it, there is just the general pattern of, of the pacification of the first world. So it's just so unusual for first world countries to exercise violence against each other. So again, while it's not impossible, but uh, nevertheless, I don't see it as too big of a worry. Really, I would say that regardless of what else happens in the world, I think that as long as we can go another hundred years without a nuclear war, then we are on the path to total world peace and things are going to be fine. So in the same way that it is currently absurd to think about Norway and Sweden fighting a war, right, or the U.S. and Canada, right, in a hundred years, the world is going to be so rich, so fat, so happy, so content that there's just going to be very little warlike impulse left. So and I could be wrong, and I'm still a little bit worried that about the transition period. But yeah, overall, I think that we are on a good course towards world peace. Uh, so just the general point of you know, say, what are the well, you know, like, what is what are the like like have there uh, have there ever been two countries of the world that would both had a GDP of over twenty five thousand dollars per person? Have they ever fought a war with each other? And I think the answer to that is no.
So once everybody's there, then I think that this pattern will generalize. Can't be sure, but I think it's very likely. Do you think anarcho-capitalism will actually be achieved within the next, say, 100 years? No. no I think that's very unlikely. Again, you know, my, my most likely scenario, which I always distinguish what I think is likely from what I think should happen, that's a very useful kind of discipline. So yeah, I think we're just going to muddle through, right? So the systems that we currently have are suboptimal in a lot of ways, but if you look out your window, the rule's not on fire. There is a general pattern of progress, right? So COVID may make it hard to remember that, but that is nevertheless the long run trend is that the world is getting richer, more prosperous, healthier, technology is improving. So you know, things have really uh, got, you know, gotten a lot better over the long run and uh, reasonable that to think that will continue. Um, and I just don't see too much pressure for any kind of major policy reforms in most countries. Again, you know, so it's possible that there will be a move in the direction that I want. I'm not that optimistic. And of course, I got a lot of friends thinking things are going to get a lot worse. And again, maybe they're right. Again, I wouldn't be that pessimistic. So muddling through is, I think, the most likely scenario, uh, which is disappointing. Like, you know, people often ask me about open borders. Will there ever be open borders? And my usual answer is, I think there will be, but it's going to happen after it's really going to be that helpful. Because again, the real gains from open borders happen when some countries are much richer than other countries. Once almost all countries have very similar levels of economic success, then you no longer have much to gain from moving labor from low productivity countries to high productivity countries. And then most of the economic benefits of open borders then will no longer be around. Uh, but uh, that's uh, my best guess. I could be wrong, hopefully. So, well, I hope that I'm wrong on things won't improve. I hope I'm right on things won't get worse. Let me put it that way. Do you think automation will be a significant issue for labor in the future? Uh, nope. Uh, so, I mean, here's the main thing about the history of automation. Automation has been fantastic for labor over the long run. Living standards are much higher than they used to be. And again, this comes down to, well, on the one hand, automation might put you out of a job. On the other hand, automation might go and give you some nice cheap stuff. And what is the net effect? And again, the net effect, we go back to that adage, the secret of mass consumption is mass production. And we see that countries that have had a whole lot of automation now have super high living standards. And countries that have had little automation continue to have low living standards. So that all fits. In terms of particular workers losing out, of course, that's possible and it has happened. But then normally those workers just go and find a job someplace else. Again, like what about, what if there are no more jobs? I think this, is, this has never happened over, over anyth anything longer than a short, than the short run, right? So what happens is that when automation puts some workers out of work, they go and they find something else to do. And there's always something else, right? People have trouble imagining what the something else will be because we don't plan the future out that far. Usually we don't figure out what do we do with all of this labor that's sitting around until it's actually been put out of work or at least it's imminent. So during the Great Depression, uh, we got unemployment up to a really high level and there were a bunch of people saying, see, automation has destroyed our economy. That's the answer. Uh, that's why we've got unemployment at 25%. Before COVID, unemployment was bound to below 4%, right? So it's not automation that does it. We can always figure out new things to do with labor. We always have, and I don't see any reason to think that we won't do so indefinitely, right? And when people talk about, oh, but what about really low-skilled labor? There's plenty of things for low-skilled labor to do, just working in retirement homes or you know, dri you know, like, you know, driving Uber. Or again, when, if that gets automated, then there'll be something else for people to do. Um, again, I know that something else always sounds vague and dissatisfying. All I can just say is look at history. The people that would have waved their hands and say, the people that are losing their jobs through automation will just do something else have always been correct, right? And, and to say this time is different. By the way, actually, back in around 2008, I had my colleague, Tyler Cowan, he did say, yep, this time it's different. This time the jobs aren't coming back, Brian. And we actually came up with a very extreme bet where he bet me at, with 10 to, 10 to 1 odds in my favor that U.S. unemployment would stay above 5% for 20 years. And within two or three years, he'd lost, right? And unemployment was back down to below 5%. So that's uh, the actual story. And again, just main thing to remember is automation is something that we should welcome because it raises production per worker, and which means higher living standards. That is where almost all the production we've had over the last couple of centuries comes from. And we should really be hoping to get a lot more of it. The disappointing thing is that actually the golden age of automation seemed to be more like from the 20s to the 70s. And now we are in at best a silver age of automation, maybe even a bronze age of automation. There are obviously some really prominent changes that are happening, but relative to things that happened in early, like in earlier in the 20th century, what's happening now is fairly modest. 
So when you can say that's going to change, but that's all just a blank check of people making predictions without anything to back it up. So hope they're right, but I don't think they are. So thanks so much for coming on. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to mention or anything like that? Uh, well, like I said, so um, you know, you've asked me a lot of fundamental questions about my overall worldview. I, re I hope the people who don't already agree with me are listening. I understand that when you hear worldview very different from your own, it's tempted, tempting just to say the person's crazy and doesn't know anything. I hope that I at least have gotten over that barrier and don't sound crazy. Uh, right. I guess the main thing I would say about anarcho-capitalism is that if we're talking about pressing a button and just getting rid of the government today, I agree that would be crazy. So that would indeed lead to oceans of blood because you're just getting rid of a system that we have and replacing it with nothing. Uh, so to picture what I'm talking about, it's much more helpful, helpful just to think about where the dial of government is now on these last areas to say police law and courts. And I would say actually the dial right now is maybe at say a six on a dial that runs from zero to 10. So we are not anywhere close to having government completely run these areas right now. We've got private security guards, we've got private arbitration, we've got arbitrators that write their own codes for resolving disputes. So all of the things that people think of as government monopolies, first of all, are not government monopolies now. And if you think about, so where's the dial? Like I said, probably it's like at about a six on a zero to 10 scale where 10, 10 is a true government monopoly over these areas and zero is anarcho-capitalism. And really what I'm talking about is just imagining turning down that dial bit by bit and seeing what happens, right? And I say, we could definitely have more private security. There could be more room for private arbitration. It really is pretty silly to think this would lead to any kind of breakdown of society or anything really bad. In fact, I say we would see a lot of improvement as we turn down that dial. And then the question really comes down to once we got the dial at one, what happens if we turn it from one to zero? Right, and again, we haven't turned the dial that way over the course of a few minutes or a year or 10 years. So imagine turning that dial down, down, down over the course of 50 or 100 years. And then finally you get to the last point. So can it really be the case that just this last small number of remaining police and government courts that are grossly outnumbered by their private sector counterparts can really that last click on the dial be the secret between uh, civilization and collapse, right? So that is the way that I think about these things. And again, I think when you think about it that way, it really comes down to, yeah, we could have a lot more room for what Brian is talking about. It's just a question of whether we could go all the way. And again, for that, it seems likely to me, but of course, doing it this way also gives you time to see whether I'm right. So I would leave it at that. Thanks for coming on and thank you for watching. Sorry if my voice was a little off in the interview. The live interview was recorded while I was a bit under the weather. I just really want to thank Dr. Kaplan for coming on since he has a much larger audience than me and he was actually one of the first people I invited on. See you next week with the World Federalism video and Anarchism Without Adjectives after that. Goodbye.